Maddie Loves Podcast. Maddie Loves Podcast. Welcome to another edition of Maddie Loves Podcast. I'm Matt DeSimone, your host. Welcome back. Um, it's good to be recording again. We've had a little time off of that. I was on a bit of vacation and whatnot. Um, I am here, as always, with Dr. Tom Lucas. That, yeah, that would be me. Um, where, what did you do with your break, man? I went up to Roanoke, Virginia, my hometown, for a little uh, R&R. It was nice. I went to a resort, a.k.a. mom and dad's house. Nice. Uh, so that was that was nice. It was, a, it was a nice couple days just getting back there and uh, hanging out with everyone. It's good. It's good to take a break, man. You know, I know that you are just going nonstop with your studies because that's kind of what we what we have to do, you know, sort of thing. And uh, it's really important to be able to kind of put the stops on things for a few days, unplug all that kind of stuff, you know. Right. No. And I was initially working on our first couple episodes, editing them. And I realized before I left, oh, well, I've pretty much got all this uh done except for the uh finishing up a few little things on there so it gave me a chance to kind of really just not do anything at all while i was up there and just uh enjoy myself for a couple days so you're back in it we're back in it that's right and uh i believe this will be issue three episode three right yeah this is this would be this is issue three um and uh, in this issue, uh, we have a couple things we're going to talk about, um, but uh, I guess we can just go ahead and get right into it. Um, firstly, uh, there's a, a new segment we're going to add on to uh, the list here on the uh, podcast, uh, and this segment is uh, entitled, What Are You Reading? What are you reading? I don't know. What are you reading? I like it. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to start off and I'm going to ask you first. Tom, we both read a lot. Um, We both read a lot of different stuff, but right now, what are you reading? Okay, well, Matthew, thank you for asking. And uh, I'll I'll just put one one thing I want to put out there. So um, I'm the older guy, Matt's the younger guy. And so there's stuff that I experience that's been sitting on the shelf for a while that nobody really talks about because we're, you know, pretty much as a culture, we're always on to the next big thing. And Matt is a very current comic book reader. You know, he's pulling issues every week. You know, he's reading those singles. And I'm kind of at a different part of my collecting and reading habits where I pretty much read trades. So what we're going to do in this segment is... Matt's going to tell me about something that is current that he's reading that's amazing that I should be aware of. And uh, I'm going to pull something either from the, the, the recent past, um, the reasonable past, or something out of nowhere. So uh, I'll start the segment. And Matt, what, I mean, what's your, what's your take on JMS, man? J. Michael... Straczynski, what is your what is your take on this guy? Where are you at with him? Okay, so my I'm not super familiar with J. Michael Straczynski. I know he came up with Babylon Five, correct? That's oh, his yeah. baby. All right, so that that I remember that TV show is kind of like being the um, I don't know. You had Star Trek: The Next Generation, which was Walmart. And then you had Babylon 5, which was Kmart. (laughs) I mean, not not to knock any, you know, Walmart or Kmart or whatever, but to me, that's just how I uh, envision Babylon 5. Now, as far as J. Michael Straczynski, the comic book writer, I've really only had two experiences. uh, And the third is on the way with Supreme Power. I've yet to get around to reading that, but Uh I do have the first volume. Uh, But I... Okay, firstly... It was Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, and I started reading the J. Michael Straczynski run of Amazing Spider-Man after I hadn't been reading comic books for a couple years and being in the loop and everything. So his run on Amazing Spider-Man, I loved. A lot of people don't like it. 
a lot of people, uh, you know, consider what he did, especially uh, at the latter half when he was about to leave, when, you know, they did the whole deal with Mephisto and making the deal to save Aunt May. And, you know, Mephisto's like, okay, Peter Parker, uh, you will uh, totally more or less forget Mary Jane. You were never married. However, uh, as you go on with your life, there's going to be something in the back of your mind that's telling you, you know, you lost something, but you're not going to be able right. to put your finger on it. That's the, that's the price of keeping Aunt May right. in circulation. Right, and so then J. Michael Straczynski was done with the book. Uh-huh. Uh, but I enjoyed, like, he gave Spider-Man a mythos. Uh, he told everyone that there's been Spider-Men all along, you know, throughout the ages and everything. And then he had this homeboy... Uh, this older gentleman, oh, and I can't remember his name. I want to say the guy's name is Ezekiel, but that might be wrong. I don't know. I don't, I'm not going to look it up right now. But anyway, uh, so, and he was a Spider-Man too, kind of, and was like his Mr. Miyagi along the way yeah. and whatnot. How, how do you feel about that, that, the sort of Highlander meets Spider-Man sort of uh, riff? Well, I dug it. Yeah. I totally dug it. Like, I, I enjoyed it. Um, you know, I think Ezekiel eventually bites it at the end because they introduced this villain, Morlin, who has been uh, hunting Spider-Man forever. And they brought it back around here recently with uh, the Spider-Verse because you're dealing with Morlin and his entire family that just want to kill all the spiders and all the dimensions and all that stuff. But anyway, I'm going way past J. Michael Straczynski here. <laughs> but anyway, I enjoy J. Michael Straczynski's run on Amazing Spider-Man. So when in 2000, I want to say 10 or 11, I think it was 10, when they announced J. Michael Straczynski was taking over Superman at issue 600... Oh, man, I was so excited. I was yeah. like, this is going to be great. J. Michael Straczynski writing Superman, and then he has Superman pretty much walk the earth. Stop using his powers and figure out, you know, if he has a place on planet So earth. it's an existential kung fu yeah, crisis, right? and it was extremely disappointing. He took over Wonder Woman too, and gave her the leather jacket and the pants, and uh-huh, everybody right. flipped out. You know, right, yeah. Uh, whereas I think maybe now, if they did that, everyone would be like, "Yeah, you sure." Know? Well, that that's the that's the zeitgeist right, right. now. Is uh, uh, people want their whopper their way? Sure, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, um, but yeah, my experience with J. Michael Straczynski as a writer isn't a lot, but uh, like I said, from what I read. With the Amazing Spider-Man stuff I loved, opposed to the stuff that I read from him in DC. Okay, yeah. He's working on something right now. I don't know what book it is, and that's terrible. I should know that. I was hoping you would know. No. Actually. Uh. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, because he, he's a worker. He's a working writer. Uh, he could turn out those pages. Uh, Babylon 5 is really, you know, I think what effectively puts him on the map. Babylon 5 has a pretty serious fandom, too. It's funny, though. It's not an easy show to find. Uh, I don't even... The last it, time I checked, there was nowhere online, like no Netflix, no Netflix. Amazon, no Hulu, any of that. And, you know, I think you have to go and get the DVDs if you really want to do it, you know. And so there's a, and there are a lot of episodes, so you have to really really want to you know there's no like casual way to get in so yeah i think jms is a real hit or miss kind of guy you know um uh and 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 can be fairly divisive uh the book that i was going to uh suggest as a read to you today is a uh 12 issue run he did with top cow uh the turn of the century 2000 2002 called midnight nation and uh what Midnight Nation is, is is this metaphysical, almost Gnostic sort of um, story. and uh, Gary Frank. It, it's a co- co- sort of cosmic horror uh, uh, sort of situation, too. Um, the basic premise is, is our protagonist, who's a cop, uh, is, uh, you know, basically busting a crime, and there's some weirdos that are there, and he's attacked, and he basically dies. And when he comes to, he's in our world, but he's no longer in our world. A lot of people appear shadowy to him. Okay. And what it turns out is, is that, and the, this is this was my read on it. There's the Wikipedia summary was a, kind of a different read. Is that basically in this in this comic world here, God is evil, 
right, and uh, has decided that um, uh, the the Earth was uh, and and the human race was a waste of time, and he wants to start over. So he's basically sucking people over to a shadow version of our world until uh, Earth Zero or whatever is empty, and then he can restart it. You know and you know, what I know about the Gnostics is there's two gods. There's the god that everyone worships who happens to be a false god and who's evil. And then there's a real god who's beyond all any com comprehension, right? So it's got horror. It's got a twist on uh, religious themes, metaphysical themes. It's uh, got some really great pop and art. Yeah, Gary Frank is an amazing artist. It's um, just so clean, right? Yeah, and, and, and what's really cool about this is you said it was from like 2000, 2001, you know, and this is really before uh, Gary Frank, I think, uh, uh, blew up as far as an artist goes, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, Yeah, it's got to be... A, a, this is solid, though. It looks beautiful. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a hell of a read, and... Uh, it was one of those things where I just picked it off the shelf and went, I, you know, I what I like about it, too, is that, you know, I, I don't have to worry about any continuity picking up this book. Right, exactly. You, know? you can jump right in. It's, it's just, just like picking up a novel. I don't even know why it says volume one on the side. Because that's it. Because this is the book. Right. You know, and um, I like reads like that. I like reads where I don't have to come in do any previous research or any of that kind of stuff so um uh also rising stars was another one of his i really want to read that yeah, yeah i yeah. really want to read that he he was i think he was doing that when he this was around the time if i'm not mistaken that either he started on amazing spider-man or he was coming on because i know j michael straczynski wrote the amazing spider-man um 9-11 issue Right. And yeah. I, yeah. Man, and I was, and that was when I was starting to get amazing every week. And that month, I didn't get that book and missed out. And that book is still, as far as like recent comics go, that's a money comic still. Right. But I remember my buddy, uh, he had a copy of it, and during that period of time, which we're not going to quite segue into yet, but we traded that issue for a ton of Marvel Hero Clicks. <laughs> uh, oh, that's good. That's yeah, something we're right. going to talk about in a yes, little bit. We'll, right? get, yeah. we'll get to that. We'll get to that. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. But uh, Midnight Nation sounds awesome. And um, once I'm done uh, with the first stack of must reads you gave me, I should probably add that. Yeah, to no, the authority it, it, to it, it'll definitely come your way. The other thing too about you know about the book, in addition to it being a, just a pick up and read and not have to worry about anything before or after, or any of that kind of stuff, is you know JMS is a contemporary comic book writer uh, who's been working for a while. His stories are cohesive. Uh, the narrative is clear, um, and he's not snarky, cynical, uh, or overly clever. Sure, you know. And I think that when you've been in comics your whole life, you do want to, like, tip the hat, nod, and wink, and do a lot of those right. things. And I enjoy that in sure. a book. I do. But sometimes I like just a straight read. And he's one of those guys that he just delivers a story, and and that's all there is to it. So Midnight Nation, cool. that is a uh, that is, uh, worthy pickup. Well, right on. Yeah, it's... Uh... I mean, before you said anything about that today, I've never even uh, heard of that book. Nobody talks about it, yeah. which is why I wanted to. That's kind of what I want to do with my end of this feature is pull things off the shelf that I never see anybody talk about. It's, I mean, it is, what, 13 years ago, 14, 15 years ago book, mm -hmm. right? Decade and a half. Wow. <laughs> you know? So, um, and... There's so much content. Oh, uh, yeah. There's so much stuff to read. You can never know everything about everything. Right, exactly, right? exactly. So, so anyway, uh, what should I be reading, Matt? Uh, well, okay, so um, more on the, more on the, uh, the, the major uh, two labels, um, it's, just, it's just mainly what I have always stuck with as far as uh, my reading goes. Um, but uh, we have... Marvel Secret Wars going on now. Uh, Huge. Yeah. For anybody that is that is unfamiliar with, with Marvel Comics, period, uh, 
this Secret Wars is... It's not like... A, they keep saying it's not like a reboot for the the Marvel Universe. It's totally a reboot. It's right? totally a reboot for the Marvel Universe. The original Secret Wars was was one of these ideas based on uh, a toy line, uh, and then Mar- that's completely true. Then Marvel editor in chief Jim Shooter, uh, I think this was back in like 1984, 85, was like, "Well, I'll write a story. We can sell a comic that falls in line with you know." Why all these heroes and villains are all together, or whatever, you know? Uh-huh. What, if does you know, and give give the uh, the toy line something to relate to. It was the second time that Marvel had done that. Right, exactly. So he came up with this big giant villain that uh, took a bunch of different, you know, uh, chunks of of planets all over the cosmos and created this one super planet called Battle World. Uh, and and in that story. I do believe it was Denver, Colorado in the United States that got pulled into Battle World. That sounds right. And and everyone else boarded this big, you know, random ship that lands in Central Park and they're all like, "What is this? Oh, let's get aboard and see what happens." You know, so- what Yeah, I you know, I was young and alive and buying the toys and buying those books when they came out. And for my money, the greatest scene in Secret Wars is when Spider-Man makes the X-Men look silly. He's spying on him. They're like, hey, who's that? And then you see what a veteran guy he is. Right, exactly. And yeah. that they are students. Right. Because he bounces all over that room, makes them all look silly, and then he's out. Yeah. It's pretty epic Spider-Man. Yeah, Spider-Man moment. for me, too. And, and this was going back to what we were talking about uh, earlier before we started recording. Spider-Man for me, initially, when I first read Spider-Man, it was a story involving the X-Men. So for me, in my mind, I have always thought Spider-Man could be a mutant with just what he goes, what he's gone through, and like his abilities and everything. Well, he he's has been mu- mutated. Yeah, right. It's very right? mutant like. Uh, but but anyway, uh, digressing from from where I was headed here. So uh, we have the Secret Wars reboot going on. It's kind of similar to where we do have a battle world, but instead of one uh, entity. Uh, sucking in all of the, the the chunks of all these planets from all over the cosmos, uh, Dr. Doom, in order to save the Marvel 616 universe, uh, formed uh, chunks of all Marvel uh, 616 kind of canon and ultimate canon and into one for like singularity to where now our battle world consists of not a bunch of random uh, chunks of the universe, but it's a bunch of uh, eras in the Marvel universe. Uh, so like you know, for it's instance, almost like the timeline made into a physical place. thing, right? You've got Age of Apocalypse, like you know the west, the Eastern Hemisphere. It seems to be like all the X Men worlds, Inferno, Age of Apocalypse, Extinction Agenda, Years of Future Past. Uh, all these, all or Days of Future Past, which is the book is called Years of Future Past. So, uh, and then uh, you got the Korvac saga area. You've got Planet Hulk that's there. You know, I mean, all these things. But out of all of this, all of the tie-ins, they're they're using all these regions to tie into the Secret Wars. You know, to kind of bring ba- you back and relive some of these stories uh, with as as if there was an extra chapter added on with. Uh, still knowledge of all this other shit that's gone on in the Marvel Universe over the past, hell, 30 it's years. It's so smart to... Sure. God, man, Marvel's firing on all cylinders. They are. Because if I'm new to the Marvel Universe, and this is like going to be one of the first things I experience, or maybe I'm a casual reader or whatever, seeing these different worlds, these different eras, which are basically story arcs, Absolutely. you know, I'm looking at it and I go, hey... Maybe I should go pick up sure. that trade. Right. Or maybe I should go pick up those back issues. Yeah. Because this looks really cool. Whatever this was, I For missed sure. that. You know, and sort of thing. So, wow, man. And it's not hit and miss, too. There, there have been some issues that I've read. I've read almost all the tie-ins. And some of the issues I've read have been kind of, you know, eh. But there's some stuff that's really good, like Old Man Logan, like Planet Hulk. Old Man Logan is the bomb, man. That's a great book. And Bendis is writing, uh, Brian Michael Bendis is writing the Old Man Logan tie-in, and it is, it's solid, man. That uh, Sam Humphreys is writing Planet Hulk. That's really good. But one of our favorite writers... Uh, Garth Ennis uh, is Ennis. writing the book I want to talk about, which has really nothing to do with like 
anything superhero wise. It's a book called Where Monsters Dwell. That cover is gorgeous, yeah, by and, the way. And it's, oh my god, it's, that pops. It's based on, you know, this old, I guess, like monster comic from back in the day yeah. that Marvel uh, that Marvel had. And this book is pretty much like, you know, I was talking about in like the first podcast, flipping on like uh, American movie classics and watching like an old, like, you know, a, a film from, from the 50s, from the early 50s to where you have this World War One era pilot who's like on break from World War, you know, after the war, you know. Okay. And, and uh, he he has this buddy of his, and right away he owes him money. And you can find out the guy's name's Carl Kaufman, and you can find out that this guy is very um, uh, like the guy from Uncharted. Uh, he's got a little bit of Indiana Jones. So kind of to a little him. Daredevil action adventure and type. real, real quick. And he's real like, ah, oh, come on, man. Yeah. You uh-huh. know, he's he's a little Han Solo, Han Solo, definitely. Kind of he's a swindler, okay, for sure. Yeah. Um, and so initially, he owes this guy money, and right away, this woman needs to get a a, a private chartered flight from wherever they are to some place far away. I can't remember exactly. She shows up. Uh, you know, bombshell, beautiful, and immediately uh, uh, this uh, Kaufman's like, yeah, sure, I'll take it. And she's like, well, you know, how much is it going to cost you? And he's like, well, I don't know. How much are you going to give me or whatever? And she hands him a big wad of money, which his friend just scoops up from him. And he's uh, like, hey! <laughs> you know, that type of thing. Right, yeah, sure. So they get up in the end of the first issue. They get up in the plane, and they're flying, and they get in the middle of this thunderstorm. Well, as they're flying in the plane, this woman's talking, and this guy's realizing that she's not, like, as ditzy as he thought, and she kind of knows stuff. Like, they're in the plane, and she's talking about the plane itself, you know, and she's talking about the guns and whatever, and, you know, it's kind of like, you know, this Uh, is a, you know, who is she? You know, I don't think she's who she claims she is. Well, anyway, this bolt of lightning hits the plane. They end up crashing into prehistoric land. Okay. Okay, so they're in, like, this prehistoric island, and there's pterodactyls and tyrannosaurs, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And so the second issue is pretty much them just running, uh, you know, from all this stuff that's coming after them. And then they end up finding this island, and they get to the island, and it's full of Amazonian women. And at this point, Carl beforehand was like, oh, we're going to die, we're going to die. And then they get there, and he's like, uh, uh, <laughs> right? And right, then yeah. after, and then, uh, you know, he walks up and he's like, he looks over at, uh, what's her name? I can't even remember her name, the the, the, the female uh, lead. I think Clementine Franklin Cox. Clementine. Is her name. Clementine. He looks at Clementine and he's like, hey, sorry about this. And then she's looking at him with just as big of a smile as he has. And he's like, what? And that's the end of the that, second okay. issue. All right, is so that where it's at? That's where it's at right now. So yeah. that's, this is where she wanted to be. Oh, right? yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. So. So all of the passes he was making on her, you know, this whole time were like, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't, you know, giving him the time of day or whatever. Right. And he was like, nobody's around, you know, no one knows we're here. Let's just enjoy ourselves. And she's like, I will kill you. <laughs> you know? And so in the end of the day, you realize that he is not necessarily her preference, okay. so to speak. So, yeah. but you know, that's on top of just the fun hijinks of you know flying around, shooting down pterodactyls and whatnot. Is you know? the rest of the book as gorgeous as that cover? Okay, so uh, Frank Cho. Yeah. Does all the covers. Oh, yeah. Okay, the guy, Russ Braun, who's drawing the interior, has a very uh, realistic approach to where the characters themselves aren't... They don't necessarily look like uh, actors or whatever, but this dude could totally say, okay, I want it to look like this actor oh, playing this yeah. role. And he could... And he could, he uh, could pull it off. That's, yeah. That's, that's solid. Uh, you know, Garth, Garth Ennis... A lot of his books, it seems that he 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 works with artists who use realistic proportions for mm-hmm. the most part, um, and uh, uh, it's it's um, there, there's just a realism about them that I appreciate. You know, even though Crossed is uh, um, a crazy, crazy, crazy book. Um, 
you know, the proportions are still correct. He he actually has like a that. very Gary Frank quality to him now yeah. that I think about it. You know, it's funny that I just looked at Yeah, the color of the art. lines. But sure. yeah, and also the face too. Very realistic features. I mean, I just, I really, I really enjoy the book. It's it's different from all the other Secret Wars stuff that's going How on. How is it going to even fit into the, the 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 schema of it all like i mean is it just a straight just spin off hey we're going to have some fun here right. or is it ever going to come into the full secret wars battle world yeah like i have situation i i have i have no idea um on what where exactly they're going to go with it but i mean I, you know i think it might have been one of those things to where like okay We've got all these old books we're bringing back. What's an old fun book we we enjoyed? Us us here at Marvel, you know, the Brain Trust, you know, we're coming up with all these books. What was one book we really enjoyed? You know, monster where monsters dwell, you right. know. Or maybe they went to Garth Ennis and they were like, "Do you want to write a Secret Wars tie-in? If so, what's something maybe you would want?" And to he write? did like the Grant Morrison thing where he's like, "Well, I'm an encyclopedia of maybe. everything you've ever done." Yeah, right. And there's and, this thing. That you did from 1934 to 1938, or you know, because that's like the Grant Morrison thing. He's like, here's a character that was in panel three of a Batman from 1952, right? You know, and I'm gonna do a whole trade based on that character. Yeah, but right? I, that's a Morrison movie. But now I don't know if Carl Kaufman himself was like a main character in Where Monsters Dwell back in the day. I haven't done that much research on it, but if they continue this book as an ongoing. I'm all in. I'm totally all about it because this book, Where Monsters Dwell, Secret Wars tie-in, check it out because it is it's super fun. Right. Well, you know, and sort of contrary to the book I picked too, is that something like this you can read it at a couple levels. One, you just pick it up. It's a rollicking adventure. You read it in the back of your mind. You know, hey, this is, they're calling on some piece of history right here, and then later you start doing a little reading up. And then you get double the pleasure from reading the book because you do investigate its history. You learn a little bit about the exactly. trivia. It becomes even more fascinating than maybe you reread it again and you look for the little callbacks, you know, sure. homage yeah, yeah, yeah. or whatever. So, you know, that's a completely different reading experience. My suggestion, totally want to check that out. Yeah, totally. No, it's, 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 a, fun, it's a fun time. I, I really enjoyed it. It was one of those books, too, that I that I put on my list kind of not really knowing what to expect and and when I got it the week I got it I was like oh yeah this is just another 499 I have to drop today you yeah. know whatever but uh, it was t it's totally worth it you know, you know it really is it's uh it, it's the thing is the, the books are, are are certainly more expensive than they used to be but you know um they're permanent you know you people buy a cup of coffee for five bucks they drink the cup of coffee it's gone forever right you know you buy a book you collect them you can return to them that's you know, my whole it's... theory too with comic books you know in this day and age they're they're so expensive to buy weekly it's it's kind of ridiculous um compared to i'm paying i'm paying at least 15 dollars more for a regular stack of books that i usually would get you know uh, back then compared to now you know usually I run about eight to ten books a week yeah um, and it costs about 15 to 17 dollars more now wow. and that's with the old classic pull list discount too so so you got to be you got to be careful well you got to pick well oh well and that's the whole thing now with 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 secret wars wrapping up I kind of told myself you know what I'm gonna go all in on secret wars I'm gonna read a lot of the tie-ins and and as much as I'm digging everything I see what they're rolling out for October and I'm like okay this is perfect time for me to kind of cut back a little bit, uh, focus in on the books that I really, really enjoy, and also I'm, I've, I've really, as we were talking, we've talked about, I, I'm really getting into more creator-owned, independent comic books. I think that's the place to be, man. And they're, they're cheap, you know? they're affordable, and if you don't want to get them right off the jump, it's no big deal because with Image, especially the first collection they put out is always $9.99. Right? You know, yeah. It's always nine ninety nine, and it's and it's totally worth it. You're basically paying for a free comic book, more than likely when you get that. Yeah. Because uh, it's usually about a five to six issue run. So um, so yeah, uh, you know, dialing back after Secret Wars, but until then, uh, I sure as hell am gonna enjoy 
uh, Where Monsters Dwell, and some of the other titles too. Because so there, there, there are some really good books that they're they're doing right now. We mentioned, or I mentioned Grant Morrison briefly. Did you hear the news? I read it this morning. Okay, man. so E I C Heavy Metal Get out. 2016. That's crazy. I mean, oh my god! I'm gonna have to subscribe. Oh, I'm coming back, Heavy yeah. Metal. <laughs> I'm coming back. My God, man. <laughs> Heavy metal is such an influence on me. Yeah, and I, you know, I came upon it basically by buying old issues at comic book conventions when I was a kid. I was like, "What is this?" Because you know, European swords and sorcery, European science fiction looks different. It looks like a meatloaf album cover. <laughs> That's what I always thought right? of yeah. when I was a kid. I thought heavy metal. Whoever like did all the art on the covers of Heavy Metal magazine when I was a little boy, I was like, they got to be responsible for Bat Out of Hell. Right. Oh, yeah. You know, and I have not really looked at it in some time, but heavy yeah. metal at for a good while there was a big influence on a lot of people. Grant Morrison. Crazy. Man, and you know what? This could be like a... Uh... A revival too, the beginning of like a revival to where you know how magazine you know collected like comic books like right. there aren't any that exist really other than the ones that have been able to stay through the test of time and those are just one to each genre almost like heavy metal to your sci-fi fantasy or mad magazine to your you know yeah. comedy yeah but yeah outside of those two right now off the top of my head I can't really think of a magazine comic right. that is released monthly that people still talk about and still buy. Probably the 2080 people are doing something. You know, a lot of that is only uh -huh. available in the UK. Right. So I, you know, occasionally I'll see uh, an advertisement and I'll just like, you know, cry but it's, but quietly. It's, and... it's, <laughs> but it's not as regular though. No, you know, they well they have their periodical, you know, and they're like an issue 2100 or whatever. They call them progs programs. Sure. And, uh, but they've been doing a thing all year where they're taking all the great Judge Dredd story arcs from the last 30 years and issuing them as a monthly hardcover collectible that when they're on your shelf all together, they form a, 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 a landscape image. Of Mega City uh, One. Me yeah, Mega City One or all the characters, or I forget, whatever. It is like... I just cry because it's UK only. They will not ship to US. It's almost like they're saying, we don't like money. Right. You know, because <laughs> for every one of me, there's got to be a hundred dudes that would totally pony up the 400 bucks, Hell 500 yeah. bucks, or whatever it is for this, like, 30-volume set or whatever. And I just don't have the wherewithal, and uh, we can transition this into the next segment. I just don't have the wherewithal to spend all that time on eBay and in forums trying to track these issues down and paying five times what I should mm -hmm. just so that I can have them and things like that. It's going to be one of those things that exists that, uh, you know... Not going to have you know, right, not gonna now. Have, you know, right, right now. Right now. Yeah. You know, I think... Powerball. Right. Powerball. I'll just fly over and buy them all at the end of the year. Right, yeah. I <laughs> think eventually... Back. I think eventually they will become available. Um, but it's going to be one of those things to where in a couple years you're like, yeah, well, I was on... E Amazon and I found volume one, two, and four, but I couldn't find anything else. And I mean, since this is all they had, I had to go ahead and yeah. just get it. Right. You know? Yeah. Uh, so, but I think eventually, like all things, you know, they they are gonna want their money from uh, us stupid Americans. Well, so. yeah, you know. So I'm I'm gonna subscribe to Heavy Metal because I doubt that. I don't know. Do you think the comic shop? Dude, I'm all about would, that. Would pick I mean, it up? Do you think that they'd start carrying it? Absolutely. Because, I mean, it's Grant Morrison, Absolutely. Right? Are you kidding me? It, it isn't going to be one of those things to where they're going to they're gonna have ten of them on the shelf, but if you want them to pull it from previews weekly or, or monthly, absolutely they'll have one for you, yeah. for sure. And probably, too, when you do it that way, you're going to end up with, like, that plastic, you know, uh, cover around it, and, yeah. and something cool is going to be in there for you. But I'm almost thinking that getting this thing at cost in the mail might be worth it more than getting it in a comic shop yeah, because yeah. that's when you kind of get more exclusive sort of stuff. I remember I, I subscribed to Empire Magazine for a while. Oh, sure. yeah. And so when I'd get my issues here and I would be out at Barnes & Noble or whatever doing what I, whatever I was doing... I would walk by the magazine rack and I would notice that their issue of Empire 
for one, was a month behind mine. Uh-huh. Secondly, it was not the same cover, you know. So, so I, you you were getting the the exclusive, right? You're right. Oh sub- yeah, the so, subscriber the sub- edition. Yeah, the subscriber yeah. edition for so. sure. For sure. So yeah. So anyway, I think in February we'll be talking. Heavy metal, and I'm sure there's going to be some choice previews. Oh, man. And you know, he's writing a story or two. Has to be. Has to. He's EIC, man. Oh, yeah. Do whatever he wants. Yeah, it's going to be heavy Morrison. Right. You know, that's basically what it's going to be. Wasn't Peter Laird or Kevin Eastman the editor of uh, Heavy Metal there for a while? Oh, my God. I don't know. One of the Turtle creators. Really? I want to say he was. One of the two was the editor in chief. You know, that seems like an acceptable reality to me because, you know, uh, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was an indie. It was an outsider book. Yeah. And the art was not what was the house style of Marvel at the time. The Very art was gritty. not what you would find in um, at DC either. And that's, of course, you know, what what created the big indie boom in the late 80s, mid, mid-80s? Yeah, we'll say mid-80s to late 80s. A lot of black and white self-published titles, small presses, that's where Dark Horse Comics comes out, mm-hmm. and some other things. That's a show. For sure, because oh, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. a very special era oh, man. of books. Going back to the artwork with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, it always the early stuff, when I look at it, it reminds me of like knowing a kid in high school that could draw really good, that was completely self taught. Uh huh. You know, that that artwork in there for some reason, I think it was the it's the black and white too, without right. the color. It, it always to me looked like it was drawn by like this teenage kid who could just draw really good and sure. have like this good idea. You yeah. know, I mean, hell, I don't know uh, uh, Laird Neesman's you know art background or whatever, but um, me either. I'll tell you though, seeing it on the stands when I was just buying all that standard kind of stuff and going, "What is this?" Mm-hmm. But there's a there's a really sad twist to the story. So that first year the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles came out, I bought everything on the stands as it came out. In 1997, my long box was sitting in the attic of my house that oh. was hit by a tornado. So I could potentially have a, the the value of a, a a nice car that went up uh, in the air that day. Wow. So, but you got got to let these things go. But I really, you know, definitely. Uh, uh, a topic for a future show for sure uh, maybe we can discuss various eras uh, of comic book history oh, you know absolutely. sort of hit hit the highlights and the low lights and things like that yeah could be a good time we'll bring in Roland man sure we dedicate we a whole show stuff. to uh, Rob Liefeld's work I'm sure you know. <laughs> I yeah so let's talk we can talk about it maybe I just need to process fully process it publicly and then I can move on. I mean, I could sit here and try to debate with you uh, (laughs) why Rob Liefeld is so important to comics, but I feel like it's just going to be a mute argument, you know, and I'm going to be totally wasting my time. No, no, you wouldn't be. And I think it would actually be really cool to hear, you know... That's you know what so what are you we talking like saw, early nineties? We talking like saw, early nineties. You first basically? saw Rob Liefeld with fifteen, sixteen year old eyes. Yes. Okay. I first saw Rob Liefeld with like seven year old. eyes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So uh-huh. it was kind of different, and and it, and for me during that the next like real ten years, I wasn't a story guy. I was still all about the art. Oh, I yeah. I did. did I that. wonder why there were never any feet. Any, or why everyone had so many pouches? Right. It wasn't until Heroes Reborn until I, I thought to myself, "Man, these guys are pretty much just mailing it in here for the for the for the check." <laughs> Look, man. you know, Rob Liefeld, he made it. He's money. Yeah, dude, he's a money artist. He and did of a course, Levi's commercial, bro. He did. He did a Levi's commercial, and he's the father of Deadpool. So that Certainly. is one of our great. That is right. One of our great gifts to the, the comic book world. So. You know, he's successful. Sure. Am I a successful comic book artist? No. So, Rob, you got that <laughs> on me, dude. And you will always have that. So, you know, uh, um, but there are many, many great artists. It's an interesting thing. And, uh, yeah, we could talk about that. I'd love to talk about uh, in the future, too, the birth of Image Comics, those early days. Mm. The things that happened there. And kind of the... Um, 
the uh, hits and misses of Todd McFarlane sure. over the years. Uh, a big miss would be spending all that money on Mark McGuire's uh, record-breaking oh, that's right. ball and then touting oh. it around town and oh. all that. So sorry, Todd, but I really do love the action figures. A I'm whole pretty lot. sure that that thing has came and went since then. I'm, I don't I don't know if he owns he that spent or... a lot of dough on that baseball, bro. He always he wanted to be on ESPN, so uh, you know I think he got his wish there. So expensive hobbies. Yeah, speaking of expensive hobbies with baseball co- collecting with the cards, the memorabilia, the autographs, um, but that's not what we're talking about. Uh, moving on now to really what we uh, mainly uh, came here to uh, to discuss, and that would be where tabletop gaming has gone today. Uh, the um, the expensive hobbies uh, that we have outside of uh, well, for me, comic books. I mean, that's <laughs> so. This is the, this is your our good news, bad news, this right? Is, this is good news, bad news. Yeah, Maddie's got good news. Yeah, Maddie's got the bad news. Tom's got that good news. Tom's got bad news, good news and bad news, yeah. Um, so, tabletop gaming itself has, you know, there's been an evolution in tabletop gaming. You were talking about earlier the early days. When you were a kid... Yes, when I was a kid... What was, what was, (laughs) first of all... Put us where you were at the time, and give us a couple of the hot shit tabletop games back that were considered tabletop games back. Then. Oh my god! And, right. and and it costs like you know what what it ran you <sighs> right as well, a kid. So anyway, when I was seven, I discovered Dungeons and Dragons. You know, and uh, uh, part of Dungeons and Dragons back in the day was you 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 got a lot of they were made out of lead, the miniatures mm-hmm. that were lead. And you would buy them. Totally safe for children. <laughs> yeah, totally safe for children. You'd buy them, and you'd paint them, you'd collect them, and there were various rules for miniature warfare. Did you ever step on one? Did you ever um, step on any? Like, walking around barefooted, and you were like, you, you, I don't know if you customized and painted them or whatever, but if one, like, had fallen off and you weren't paying attention, ah, oh, it hurt so bad. I broke, I broke a lot of them, because the lead was very... Um, is a pretty weak metal, so little swords and pole axes and all that kind of stuff. And I got very good at painting the miniatures and doing like plastic models and stuff. And then uh, girls actually started talking to me, Ooh. so I had less time for oh, any, I thought they miniatures. were talking to you because you were no, painting models. No, no, I was about to say you hit a gold mine. No, no, no. I'm sure that scene exists now, but it's not. Oh, absolutely. Not anything I can participate. Anyway, so you buy these things, and the older gamers. Uh, came from a pre D and D tradition, which was war gaming, and so they would build armies filled with these lead figures, and uh, um, you know they had various rules for them. You know, Dungeons and Dragons originally comes out of a, a miniatures uh, war gaming rule set, which r- right at this very moment the name escapes me, and then other tabletop stuff. You know, um, was Risk around? Well, Risk was around, sure. Is that, that like you know, a that, really old game? Yeah, Risk is Risk is a fairly fairly old game, and that was you know that was the kind of game that uh, non people that you know are they're playing a game, but they're not gamers. You know, right. it's like a, a parlor game. It's something the family would play. It's like Monopoly or any of that kind of stuff. You know, uh, if you were into like uh, the the geek world, you know, the Dungeons and Dragons world, you might be playing Dungeon or you might be playing. There was one that was like called King of the Mountain. There's all kinds of uh, war games that were uh, published by TSR and um, Avalon Hill and um, a, a number of other companies that replicated various uh, eras and wars and things like that. But the lead figures themselves, they were pretty affordable. I mean, I remember not even really having a job and being able to you know, go up to the hobby store and pick up a few and paint them and then go get a few more. And I'm pretty sure that, you know, by the time I was rolling into high school, I probably had a couple hundred of them, 
you know, sitting around. And because they were lead, man. Where'd you keep them? Did you put them in like a tackle box or something? Tackle like box with foam. Right. You would like okay. cut little little uh, nooks and crannies out in the foam and you'd sort of pack them in. And of course you'd leave a lot of them out on display and things like that. But, you know, uh, I will one day go back to it because part of my retirement plan is to build big dioramas of Japanese medieval battles <laughs> and just paint hundreds of little samurais and do all that. And oh. My wife is totally for it, which is great. What? And I have yet to meet someone who doesn't think that is a great way to spend your retirement. That is totally great way to spend your retirement. <laughs> so, but, um, you know, something that came out in high school was... Warhammer 40k. Okay. And Warhammer, the miniatures game, and the stuff the Games Workshop does, their tabletop games, are gorgeous. Oh, yeah. no. Oh, I, my God. I just They're recently beautiful. experienced something. I uh, went to this place called Mishap Games in Roanoke, Virginia, my yeah, hometown. Yeah, what was that about? I went, I went in there. I didn't really know what was going on. I, I saw a bunch of dudes standing around like these... these sandboxes on tables almost even though like the walls were like a lot higher and they were looking down and it almost seemed like uh, one of those things at a science museum when you walk up diorama and you look in and you can like pick up rocks and you can like you know if there's water there's live starfish yeah, in there yeah. or whatever uh, and I walk up there and it's straight up Warhammer battles and there's fauna I mean there's rivers, trees, all kinds of stuff everywhere. Never seen anything like it. Don't know how you move in that damn game. Yeah. You know, I don't I don't know the uh mechanics. There's whatsoever. rules upon rules upon rules. But I'm watching these guys say, "Okay, my go." And they pull out this novella, you know, yeah. and they're flipping through these pages and they're like looking at what they got to do next. And I'm like, "What are you doing?" But I'm guessing what they were doing is running a scenario instead of doing an all-out battle. That's the only thing I can think of because, you know, if you if you know the mechanics of the game, I don't think you're p looking at a rules card, you know. Right. Why you're why you're no, playing you know. Once you've been doing it for a while, you know you you learn all of it. But if 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 anyone, you know, listening goes to the game store just and looks up, you know, the Warhammer stuff, the rule book is um, fairly intimidating. You know, it's a tome, man. Mm -hmm. It's a big old thing, and uh, uh, all Games Workshop their books, the art is gorgeous. I can just read the book and right. never play the game. Okay. You know, I like reading game books. I had a buddy of mine that was all about... He uh, he said he played the game, but he was more into reading the Warhammer books. Yeah. Like he's all about reading. Well, no, they have the novels, but I yeah. mean... I'm sick like that. Like I like reading like the Dungeon Master. I should have brought my. I should have brought the you know. X-wing. Uh, oh guy. yeah, I've, kind of, I can't believe that that's not here in front of me ah. right now. But you will give me a very accurate description of what you bought. Sure. So anyway, uh, no. And in fact, Will Wheaton recently blogged about how he loves just reading uh, RPG books. You know, the game books, not the novelizations, and. Uh, it's kind of like reading an encyclopedia, sure. You know, of a fictitious world, and uh, that's one of my things. You know, so I love that kind of thing. So anyway, um, the thing about these games, though, uh, is that it's kind of almost like a lifestyle choice because it gets pricey. Mm -hmm. It's not just like playing D and D with six or seven little lead figures on a table. We're talking. Yeah. It get you go. You can go deep. Yeah, you can. You, go can. Deep. you really, really can. Um, uh, but with with going back to when you were playing uh, tabletop games regularly, was it was it hammering you in the pocket to the point to where you were like, I gotta stop doing this? Uh, there were times where going to the hobby shop was an incredibly expensive, mm -hmm. expensive sort of um, option for for your day, and now. Because one of the things that happens is about 20 years after you enjoy something, you will long for it. Exactly. So here we are at age 45. Mm. And uh, so maybe I'm more like the 25-year mark or, or maybe a little bit later. But I spend a lot of time on a website called Noble Knight Games. And uh, it's all old stuff, all, all out-of-print stuff. It's kind of like uh, they sort of you know provide a 
a, a almost like a specific it's not an auction house like people post things though for sale sure but and you can if you're looking for something that's been out of print for 20 years you can have them notify you when it pops up in their inventory but you know i occasionally buy an old dungeons and dragons module just to look at it, right you know right. just to have it on the shelf it's crazy like that so uh, one of the reasons why we're talking about this today is uh, you're taking the plunge. Well, I'm. This is one of those things for me. It's it's unfortunate because I know how I am with uh, anything outside of comics, hobby wise. Uh, I'll pick something up and I will gung ho it for about a year. Uh, see where I, see where I am with it, both uh, in my brain and uh-huh. in my pocket, and if. I can't afford to sacrifice my brain more with it or sacrifice my pocket more with it. I usually uh, cut and run. Um, but I have never really... Okay, so uh, case in point, I was really big into Marvel DC Hero Clicks, especially when they first came out. Yeah, so no, I, I'm sure a lot of people know what Hero Clicks is, but for those who don't, what's Hero Clicks all about? Um, I wish I, I was better with technical terminology. Uh, Hero Clicks is a tabletop game to where you have these miniatures that represent all of your favorite heroes and villains in DC and Marvel Universe, and they all look awesome. And the sculpts over the past, you know, 15 years have just gotten better and better and better. Uh, and they're on these little power dials, and you click the dials uh, to see, uh, to, to see, you know, uh, what their, their abilities can do. Uh, and it's color-coded and everything, and when they take hits, you click them down to where it'll start like you know lowering their stats hence the clicks part right right? or if you're fighting like a hulk it's just gonna get stronger and stronger and stronger uh before they eventually die and whatnot and you know this it can get expensive booster packs i think for just four or five guys now run like uh 10 11 bucks when they first came out it was about like five dollars a lot cheaper but they weren't as they were more flimsy they weren't as well put together uh, and the best way to go with Hero Clicks is just buying cases. Yeah. Just a big old case. Yeah. How, so, ma- how many are in a case? Case, uh, let's see, a case I do believe is 40 booster packs, I think. So me and a buddy would go in halvesies, get a case, split them up, and then just sit there and open them all. And of course, end up with 16 million doubles, you know, just right. duplicates everywhere. What was the most obnoxious double? Like Sue Storm or something? Oh, man. Well, there have been so many sets in the past 14, 15 years to yeah. where I can't. Because they do, it's like cross uh, denominational, right? It's DC you stuff, can play it's Marvel everybody. stuff. Yeah. It's- yeah, and, 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 and I know I used to have I, I stood up for a second because I used to have a Hellboy hero clicks in here and I don't I think you went to hell <laughs> I think I actually have that that set at one point um, actually I think I had two of them I think it had like Abe Sapien and Hellboy yeah and, had the uh, whole had the whole gang um, so uh, but anyway yeah so in doing that it started to run me and getting a little expensive until that last time where I bought a case played for a couple weeks and then a month later, realized I hadn't played in like a month, and I just dropped like 150 bucks. You Is know? That, so it's 300 oh, for it's, a case. Yeah, it's a lot. It's almost 300. It's a lot of money. Uh, so anyway, uh, so and plus, you know, you, I'm a completist, man. Yeah, yeah. So I right. want every damn figure in the set. Of course. And you can't get every figure in the set just buying them. You've got to end up trading for your variant figs. Or not variants, but like your, uh, they call them super rares oh. uh, in Hero Clicks. And then there's Is that also. Like, a, uh, like an old school throwback costume or. A... Or it's like, or it could be like just super nasty, powerful character. Like know? who? Who would be a super Like you rare? could go anywhere from a super rare to being like a bat might, some obscure ass character. Okay. That just to have it is, you know, awesome because it's a rare fig. In the I would set. not want to fight against bat might. Uh, in well, no, I wouldn't either because reality in itself would just uh, yeah. melt away. It's like the Scarlet Witch, but funny. Pretty, you know? pretty much. He's and like cute. Mr. Yeah, he's cute. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Mitzelplay. Yeah, you get the two of them together. It's over. They're from the same dimension, aren't they? Yeah, I think 
think so. Dimension X, isn't yeah. that what it's called? Yeah. Uh, so maybe I'm yeah, mixed they up make with reality that. whatever they want. So how do you beat that? You know, that's like getting wished out into the cornfield kind of situation. Right. Or you get like a, you know, and, and this is this is untrue for anybody that knows here. Clicks and be like, that's wrong. But no. <laughs> but like, if you get like a Doctor Strange super rare in his astral form. Okay. You know, something like that. Yeah, okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, so I'm a completist like comic books, even if the, even like just with comic books, even if the series starts out real shitty and it's only supposed to run for eight issues and I have five issues, I'm going to get the next three just for eventually ten years from now. If I want to sell it, I can. Yeah, I bro, did you ever read The Exiles? No, okay. I didn't. I, I don't. Kn- I know that there's one volume that is decent, and everything else, the Judd Winnick stuff. Was that the good yeah, stuff? Yeah, 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 yeah. Judd Winnick stuff was the good stuff. Yeah, but like. Claremont, I, he he gutted that series. Exiles was New a Exiles book. New Exiles or whatever? It was a book I collected out of spite. <laughs> Every month it would come out, and I would buy it in the hopes that it was going to turn good finally. Oh no! And uh, that was the completest, oh, like right. uh, jumping in and going, "No, you're too far in at this point." Yeah, I'm with that. Like with TV shows, I can't stop after season five just because I'm unhappy with the show now. Sure. No, dude, we're you have to endure. We, we yeah, hate watch, hate read, right, and all that. So, what is your current poison? Well, my current poison uh, that I discovered when I went up to that, uh, when I went up to Mishap Games to meet a couple buddies of mine, is uh, the Star Wars X Wing miniatures. Um, Ooh. Yeah, it, this game, when I first looked down and saw them playing, they're having this star battle, you know, on a table, and I see all of these measurement sticks and all these dice and cards and little tokens and I'm like what in the hell are you guys doing now like uh-huh. hero clicks got confusing enough and now right. this is happening there's a lot of stuff that you gotta haul down to your gaming lair right you know okay to play right so I watch them play this game and I'm seeing what 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 exactly is going on and I'm like okay I get it uh, and then I sit down, and they're like, well, Matt, why don't you give it a run? So I was like, okay. Oh, so you jumped in. I did. I got to play uh, right after they got done with their game. I sat down, and I, and I got to play right off because uh, my buddy Jarrell, he's got every single ship, I think, almost, in the set. And he paints his, too. He gets Ooh. it. He, he customizes all his. So he's got, like, color-coded, like, rebel squadrons and color-coded imperial fleets, you know, yeah. and all this kind of stuff. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, so I sat down and, you know, had my pick of the litter. Uh, so I, and I was, and, and when you play the game, one side has to be Rebel, one side has to be Empire. Okay. It's just the way it is, man. There um, are basically two sides in Star Wars. Right, exactly. So, uh, and at the end of the day, both sides do the same thing, like as far as they're like, traits and power you know you're, stuff you're either the white pawn or the black pawn right right but you're still a pawn it's even yeah, yeah it's, it's even. even no matter what yeah and that's one thing i love about the game is it's even steven there's no bullshit like with hero clicks and stacking powers and all that other crap do I they mean, do they make a death star i just want to not know. okay so why do they not right, make a death so star? there's another there's it's another like eight hundred dollars there's another version of this game called armada Armada. Okay, which you're you're dealing with star destroyers. Oh, huge uh, stuff. This huge. You're stuff. not doing the dogfight and stuff. You're doing you, huge naval battles. And basically. Un- unfortunately, you cannot integrate your ships with the Armada stuff in X-wing because if you think about scale. it, scale, scale wise, yeah. your star destroyer is probably the size of your hand. In you in, would need the GI Joe aircraft carrier. Basically, oh, the, yeah. the toy. Sure. And you drop it on the table, there's no table Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Star the, Destroyers are huge. You know the ship in um, Jedi that is captained by uh, Adama? Uh, the, you know... <sighs> it's a trap, that guy. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, you, Zoyberg. Know, you know how it looks like it's real chunky in the back and then really thin... And then, like, big in the front, and it's got all those... Uh, oh, sure. Uh, uh, turbines in the very back of yeah, it. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, It's like sure. the most biggest ship that stands out out of all of them when they're getting ready to make the sneak attack. I, yeah, I know. Okay, I mean. so they're getting ready to... Or actually, I think you can already buy that ship now, and that's, like, one of the biggest ships in X-Wing. It's, like, 
you know, that big. And you can also buy the, uh, that, like, Imperial, like, uh, it looks like kind of like a dome, but it's like, uh, I can't, I can't. Oh, yeah. God, dude, I want to play this game. Oh, my gosh, dude. It's... What are you doing to me? Okay, all right. So, anyway. Uh, I'm starting to, move, to feel itchy. To move them, like, you know, they're on like a they're on like a one-by-one one square, plastic okay. square with a little peg to hold them up. You know, it look, they all look incredible. All, all the sculpts look I saw the badass. pictures you posted. I and... sent you the Interceptor <laughs> picture, and I sent you the Slave 1, right? Slave 1. Oh, dude. I had the toy Slave 1. with the. I put Boba, I could never figure out how it was supposed to fly because I was a dumb right, kid. Right, right. And nobody ever explained to me how it actually flies. But Yeah, I was confused myself. Yeah. <laughs> when, when, uh, and with the Boba Fett figure, those are like two by two uh, square bases yeah. to whereas your Interceptors, your TIE Fighters, your X-Wings, they're only on the one by Is one. Is Slave 1 a powerful ship? It can be. It can certainly. be. Okay. Okay, so you can run all these ships as they are. You have all your stats. How many how, when you're attacking, it's a it's a it's a it's kind of a beat the odds sort of gimmick to where like I've got two red attack die to roll, you've got three defense die you can roll. And there's like an evade side, you know. Okay. So if you roll like if I roll one hit and you roll two evades or one evade you get out of the way, you know. Uh-huh. You, uh, so, um, so anyway, Will Wheaton does great video about. He this. does Will Wheaton's tabletop, which I am a very strong advocate for. It's a really fun show. He played with Seth Green and some other people back in the day, mm-hmm. and yeah, they seem to pick it up right oh, away yeah. and just start rocking it. Totally. So you have these coordinate styles. So it goes move, then it goes. Uh, you move. You you do your action for your individual ship. Then after everybody's moved, you attack, and then you check for anybody dead or anything like that. Okay. At the end of it all. So when you move, Empire for one always goes first. They yeah. always have initiative. You have a pilot rank, like uh, in the top corner, it's like a one through nine. So if you're a one, you're going to be moving first. If you're a nine, you're going to be shooting first. Interesting. Han Solo's got a really high number because Han... Shot always, first. Right, he always shoots first. Ah. <laughs> so, so anyway, and you can and you can do things to where like there are little cards that are additional point values uh, on on your individual ships, to where you can throw it on there and like have your uh, pilot rank go down to like zero, to where even if you're like a seven and you're going to be shoot one of the first to shoot, you can also make it to where you can move first. But it'll just cost you a couple points towards your fleet because if it's like I've got a hundred point fleet, well, that's what we're gonna build. So okay. You build a hundred point squad, um, and you throw on whatever modifiers you want with little cards and everything. And every every character card on the bottom tells you what kind of modifications they can put on. So if they are not a bomber, you can't strap you know proton uh, right. charges you know to to their to their ride because they can't drop bombs. For the, you know, for people who maybe have never done any sort of miniatures gaming before, that's a very typical thing is that you're given a point value to build mm-hmm. whatever it is you're going to show up with. Right, right. You know, there are leagues mm-hmm. for this stuff, and it'll be like a 500-point league, which means that every week you're going to show up with your 500 points. Mm-hmm. And whether you go all in with one big, big thing and right. a couple little things, or you do the even spread, that, to me... Is half of it mm-hmm. is the team you show up with, you know? Yeah, it seems like what they do is, is you're gonna go one way or the other uh, competitively with this game. It's either you're gonna show up with a swarm, whereas like you've got like three Tie Fighters and two Interceptors, and you've got a bunch of shit on them to the point to where it's a hundred point team, or you roll in with like that uh, shuttlecraft, you know, <laughs> with the wings that flip down, uh-huh. and and throw like you know, there's like a Darth Vader modifier card that is completely badass. <laughs> you throw that on there, and then throw a couple Tie Fighters, and then you just move them around all together. Yeah. And that's my favorite part about the game. It isn't the battling; it's the um, uh, plotting your course. Because what you have is you have a coordinates dial, and you uh-huh. spin it. And it's got a number, and it's got an arrow. And you can either do like a hard straight, you know, just go straight forward. You can do like a soft banking uh, uh, left or, or right. Or you could do turn like hard lefts, hard right. Right. Or you can do like uh, the K turn where you just go full on, spin around, and come back. Oh, nice. But when you do stuff like that, it adds stress tokens. So when you do that, like after you move a guy without stress, you can perform an action. You can throw something on your guy, whether it's like focus or evade. 
which are a whole that's a whole other thing. But anyway, uh-huh. uh, like so so there's there's cost to certain maneuvers. But the best thing is once you get into the game and everyone's moved around and it's time to move again after there's been some fighting, you got to figure out where that guy's gonna move. Sure. According to the order of how everyone's moving, you know, yeah. so that's so, kind of almost like a chess-like right. So aspect, you, you can like have a guy move forward and do something you didn't think he was going to do, and end up just maneuvering your ship right into him and crash because you've already set your coordinates. But mm-hmm. there's some people like the slave one to where if a character moves close to him and he already has his set on uh, one of the soft uh, soft turns, he can switch it to where he can turn the other way instead yeah that's a special thing that he can do i mean it is boba right that's in there it is very funny thing about boba fett though that that uh that kind of will wheaton brought up uh in the uh in that in that little bit on youtube when they were playing the game was boba fett as a character doesn't do shit in star wars no he just sits back and looks cool yeah he just looks cool he shot his wrist rocket a couple of times and and but most of the time he just kind of stands well, what does he have like one line in the whole entire like an empire or jedi he just yeah. says like one line it's yeah. like you know uh, as you wish or something like I th- that i think that that is the 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 fandom thing where you put whatever you want onto the character right you know and actually one of the things about the more recent movies i didn't really like the whole clone army thing and uh the django bingo bango it fett, devalued boba stuff. fett as a character it did you know because like the the boba fett i like was the one they did in the marvel comics star wars comics in the late 70s where they gave him some sass yeah, yeah. he was just a, a badass mercenary right. turned bounty Talked. hunter talked and yeah you know scary yeah so yeah you know yeah um everything about boba fett has been built up because he hasn't said anything so that keeps him from ruining the character sure. and two he's got a sweet costume you know <laughs> it's cool yeah. as hell one of the ultimates yes. man that's up there with cobra commander for me um S- cobra commander but are you a veil cobra commander or are you a silver Helmet. I'm I'm a fan of Cobra Commander. Period. Okay. Okay. But he's got the veil when he's in the throne room. Yeah. But when he's in battle, he's got the helmet. Right. That's how I've always. That's how I like my Cobra Commander. Yeah, okay. Do you do you follow Cobra Commander on Twitter? I do not. Have you I ever need been? To. To the, I don't know if the guy who who posts his Cobra Commander does it regularly anymore. Yeah. If he doesn't, you guys need to go back and check out uh, his Twitter feed. Now the only problem is uh, he's very topical. Okay. So, you know, on days when, like, something bad happened in the news, yeah. you could rest assured going to Cobra Commander a couple days ago being like, ha, you know, my yeah. plan worked, or something, <laughs> you know, he has something very lowbrow to say Okay, about so it. basically, if you're sensitive to uh, events, tragic events, sure. don't yeah. go to Cobra Commander right, because... Right. Uh, he's going to uh, it's gallows humor, right? But right. anyway, so so we're I'm going, <laughs> yeah, do it. Uh, so so uh, yeah, so Cobra Commander Boba Fett, iconic costumes, and the Slave One in the game. Uh, I played last night with a buddy of mine, Jack, our friend Jack, uh, and he was the Slave One. But it's a big piece, so you got to like kind of be smart with your maneuvering, and and it's not one of those pieces that you can move up great distances at a time or you get tied up because there are asteroids and debris all over how did how did jack do he decimated me he did he wiped me out really yeah he he destroyed me he, he killed you luke. have was this luke, guy luke over yeah. to try a game out and this is what he does he wore me out man i i, I just uh, wasn't rolling i was rolling shit you yeah. know and that's part of the well, game luck yeah, yeah right, you know yeah. so uh, and when i was getting the lucky rolls at that point in time it was kind of like a moot point you know i was already pretty screwed but it was fun at the end of the game i only had my a wing left so i'm like pretty much just flying all over all over the stars and i'm forcing his ships to like crash into one another you know okay. trying to get yeah, me you're everything. just okay but i wasn't like making any any headway as far as the damage was the, what were the conditions of uh, battle cuz i know a lot of times you can set up certain conditions you to can be do mad. there are there's a whole list of battle scenarios they give you you yeah. know there's one to like where on will wheatons they were collecting cargo containers and they were carrying them across and you yeah. had to stop them from doing that yeah. Um, but yeah, there's there's all sorts of scenarios. 
uh, with the expansion packs that they give you, they add more scenarios. Um, but the main real thing, I think, with all the, the expansions and stuff, it just gives you like more cards and more modifications to add. Uh, but from what I've read so far, a lot of the Imperial modifications are tend to be a little more badass. Yeah. But, you know, none of the Imperial modifications, only some of them say on the top, imp- Empire only. You know, like uh-huh. you can use the Empire modifications that you get with the Empire cards. Well, if you're I rebels, think. you're taking from wherever sure, you can. Exactly. You're gonna you're gonna take that Panzerfaust and you're gonna <laughs> right. turn, turn it right on them Nazis. Right. So exactly. Now here's the here's the the question. Okay. Though. All right. Two, uh, two things. One, what came in the starter set, okay. and how much was it? Okay. So the starter set, I paid thirty dollars for. Thirty dollars. Okay. $30, and you get all your little measurement sticks for your movements um, that you, like, p- place into these little nodes on your thing. So, like, if it's like, a, if it's like a three, it's like about that long, you place it into the little node, you pick your guy up, and you put it in on the other end, you know? And that's how you move. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, so, so um, uh, you, get, you get all those, you get, a, you know, a bunch of cards... Uh, as far as like the modification cards go, you get your cards for you in the starter set. It comes with uh, two Tie Fighters and an X-wing. Okay. Okay. So basically, that's it. Two Tie Fighters and an X-wing, and, and they give you enough to where you could probably run either a fifty or a hundred point game just throwing modifications on the All X-wing. Right. But so it sounds to me like you bought more than the starter set. I kind of did. Okay, because. Here's the thing that kind of ties back to the good news, bad news, right? Sure. It's first of all, here's this ready-made, fun game, an IP that you can dive in, everybody, you know, Star Wars and all that. All these wonderful candy-like representations of all these fine spaceships, starships, whatever, from, from the movie. For sure. And then the wallet, you know, the money flies out of the wallet, you know, like a cartoon. So... You you bought the starter set for thirty for thirty dollars, and we got an X wing and two Tie Fighters, and then what else did we buy? Okay, so fortunately I had Jack with me, and this was this played into a lot because I was not going to go out and buy this in hopes that my best friends from back home will fly down and play X wing with me for a week. You know, I wanted to make sure that. There was somebody that I could play with down here. Well, so I, I, I will totally oh, dude, rock that. And I, uh, I, I can't wait. It's, it's guaranteed. Uh, I think we almost need to do a show. Right. With some of the highlights. Well, the uh, so so Jack and I went into the game shop, because uh, we're both actually working on a project ourselves, this little chat book. Uh, Jack's a very talented He's fella. ridiculously talented. Yeah. What is his stage name? Uh, Jason Snow. Jason Snow, and yeah. he has YouTube videos. Yeah, so check out. J- yeah, check out Jason Snow on YouTube. Uh, I, I was blown away. Yeah, because you know, back in the day, I did a lot of spoken word. I was always married to the page. Mm-hmm. I could never reclaim my words and just spit them out. I always had to when they say do a reading. Sure, it's because you're reading off the page. Right. The best I could do was this really cool like. I would let the pages fall away after I was done reading. Like, I just didn't care. It was oh, super, right. super, you know, swaggery. Right. Right? But I could never do what um, Snow? Jason Snow. Jason Snow does, which is like, go on for ten minutes. Just <laughs> bit it bat it boom ba pow <laughs> yeah. You know? So you are collaborating with a very... Very talented and I'm, writer there, and I'm drawing. I'm not. I'm not writing. You're I'm, drawing. I'm drawing. I'm illustrating his oh, chat book. I you got, uh, you got my money. Yes, yeah, I'm so, pre-ordering. So anyway, so we roll into the. We, we were working on that. I was talking to him about X-wing. He was like, "I'm down to play." I was like, "Cool, let's go." Yeah. We get in there. Um, I've been doing price checking on uh, eBay or eBay on uh, Amazon and whatnot uh, for like the past few days. Whether or not uh, thinking whether or not I want to dive in. I get there and I notice that the smart game shop has everything for just enough, like a dollar fifty less than what I would have ah! paid with my with my Prime account. Okay, oh. so I was like, "Well, damn it!" And and Jack picked up the Slave One. He was like, "Oh, Slave One, twenty dollars." Yeah, just the so shit. now you're in for fifty, and we've got four spaceships. I got the Rebel Aces. What is expansion that? Expansion pack. What is that? Okay, the Rebel Aces gave me an A-Wing and a B-Wing. 
Oh, B wings are cool. They're dope. Yeah. yeah, and there's also in the game if you get a lot of B wings together, they're really, really strong. So what is what is the function of the B wing? I think the B wing in the game, honestly, from what I can tell, is just to be a little asshole. Like, <laughs> the B wing, the B wing, if you throw enough stuff on it, is hard to hit. And it, well, it's not hard to hit. It's annoying to try to hit okay. because you can throw things on it to where. You have to roll. Okay, I hit you. Well, this thing says you have to re-roll one of your dice. And, all right, you did that. Well, I have this on here. I'm taking it off. Now you got to re-roll again, you know? Uh, and that becomes just annoying. Because they're not a dogfighter. No, absolutely they, not. Like, I always thought that maybe they were like bombers of some spacey kind. Well, like, okay, so the amount of like defense die you get for most, they'll have two to three. So you'll be able to roll two to three up against like the three die you're usually up against for the attack on the other side. But uh-huh. the B-Wing, because of its size and everything, it's only one. You only get one die to roll. Oh. So you got to put stuff on it to where you got to have at least that chance to evade one shot. Uh, so anyway, uh, so I got that, and that brought forth more cards and more goodies. Um... So I just needed to have enough to where I would have a good enough rebel fleet and he would have enough of an imperial fleet. And right then I could have stopped, but I didn't. Okay. I went and I got one more, which was the TIE Interceptor, Ooh. which is my favorite TIE fighter design. Right. I had yeah. to have it. I was like, give it, it got to get it. Yeah. So got the TIE Interceptor. So all in all, everything for me ran Close to sixty bucks, which isn't bad. And then Jack bought his twenty dollars slave one. Oh, he bought the he slave bought the one slave one. Himself. Yeah, so okay. he went in too, which was okay. cool. And I got an extra set of dice too. So sixty bucks, that's not bad. So how much is the Millennium Falcon? The Millennium Falcon is about twenty five. I about think. About twenty five. Yeah. Yeah, and okay. you get your own little cool stuff, and you know, like your guys only have like a like on their on their dials. They have this. I know you people can't see me doing this right now, but they have like a uh, a range. To where, like, if you were going up against someone in these two lines, like, if you're right outside of that line, he can't see you in the line of fire. If you're in the Millennium Falcon, you can shoot all the way around. So yeah. all you got to do is just fly around the map. It doesn't matter where you are. You can hit anyone. Oh, uh, that's Which slick. is dope. I Boba want Fett it. can shoot forward and backwards. Okay. And that's awesome, too. Yeah. Um, so, anyway. Uh, all in all... After playing my first like full night of X Wing uh, with all the miniatures, how long did mine, it take to play? It took about two hours for us to play a hundred point game, and it wouldn't have taken as long if I didn't just want to fly around and be a little bitch. Okay, you know, right. So, well, sure. So, and plus, I flew my B Wing off the map, so there's no telling what would have oh, happened. Oh yeah, yeah. no, <laughs> yeah. no! I got, I got stuck. I didn't want to hit an asteroid, and instead of taking damage, I, I decided, oh, I'll just try to maneuver. You myself ran out around. of bounds. Oh, dude, out of bounds. So it's like bounds. football, huh? Yeah. Once you're out of bounds, you're out of the game. Yeah. Out. Yeah, okay. you, that, that that ships out. So interesting. That screwed me. I was and then it was like a four on one at that point, and I just oh, you know, yeah. eventually got lit up. He finally cornered me. I could see Jack's beady little eyes like glistening with excitement. But what was dope was I hooked up Spotify to uh, my my stereo in my apartment, and so we ran through the Empire and the Jedi sound. Oh, so, that's and, the yeah, stuff. While man. we were playing, so it was. That's I mean, how I, you do yeah, it. That is only. That's the only way that I'm going to be able to play that game is. Start episode four soundtrack and just let it run, and that's why Sweet. Spotify is an amazing yeah. thing, folks. So, really so you are going to uh, ride this out for a while. I am. It's I, I'm enjoying it, and now that I, I I've talked to a few people that would be interested in playing, I think that it would be uh, even more fun. Um, plus, those guys. Uh, it's called Cool Stuff Games, uh, in one of great Florida. great store. It's great super store. nice guys, and they're. Like, it's open gaming all the time, guys. If you want to come in, sure. The guy that was working there was like, X-Wing is my favorite game. I was like, awesome. So now I know if I want to learn anything, I can bring my stuff in there, and he could be like, okay, no, no, no. Here's what you want to do. You know, so that way, if I really do want to, like, you know, go full bore, I can, you know, start playing a little competitively. But I don't have time to do that right now. I have time enough to uh, enjoy this uh, little bit of X-Wing that I have right now. Hopefully... You know, pals will jump on and get their own pieces and whatnot so we can all have a bunch of different stuff to choose from and, uh, you know, have a little fun with that for the rest of the summer into the fall because, you know, I can't I can't spend the 20 bucks on one miniature a week because I'm already spending 40 on my weekly comic books. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how I'll fit it in uh, into, like, the collection sure. of all the things that are going on, but I, I'm down. I'm yeah. down to play. You know, I, I look at the Warhammer 40k guys, and I do have a little bit of envy. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, could I choose to do that? Absolutely, I could get in my car right now, 
and buy a million man army you mm-hmm. know um I just, I, you know, you have to invest time in it to do it right. Sure. It's a passion. Oh, yeah. And it's this, a passion. And nowadays, you know, it's it's really important uh, to go on YouTube and, and look up how to play these games. Right. There's this dude I watched for about an hour and a half last night before I went to bed. Um, and he, he, he takes... The, and there's not a lot of these miniatures, by the way, which is awesome. This is a relatively new game. Right, so, you know, you can pretty much... You, you, you're going to get a bunch of X-Wings. You're going to get a bunch of TIE Fighters this or whatever. isn't one of those things to where... There's eight, like, Games Workshop, Warhammer 40K. Sure. Endless amounts of right. stuff to yeah. buy. You're not going to get packs. any doubles if you don't want them, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah. Which is great. Uh, but, um, so, I uh, forgot what I was going uh, to say about the... So you're watching a guy for an hour. Oh yeah, and a half so last I'm night. watching this guy last night, and he was, um, you know, he's just giving you a figure. He's like, "Okay, here's a figure here. This figure's really cool. This is why this ship is awesome as itself." Now, I'm gonna show you what to throw on this guy to make him even more better. You know, uh-huh. to make him even, even, even like you know. So you're nastier. getting strategy and tactics exactly. Yeah. But and not just that. I'm hearing the lingo and I'm figuring out when you know. They say certain things. I know exactly what they're talking about. You know, whereas in the beginning, I'm watching these guys fight uh, and have this star battle at Mishap Games, and I, d- you know, I'm like, "What are y'all talking about?" Right, you right. Know? So uh, hearing, you know, instead of them saying the base, referring to it as a template, you know, it's base template, whatever the hell. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, it's just uh, different, different uh, terminology and stuff that, that that comes with playing any new game. So I just, you know, I thought that it would be important here to, to uh, you know, in in our podcast on on talking about you know tabletop games and everything because it's just is it, you know it's not just another hobby. You know, it, like you said, it can be a lifestyle uh, <laughs> if you if you want it to. Be. Yeah. When you see like these the the folks that are coming into that store that you're going in, they're they're unpacking this stuff for sure. It's a labor of love. Yeah. And they're spending a lot of time doing what you're doing, watching videos, reading up strategy and tactics so that they can mop the floor with yeah. other people. You know, because yeah. it's competition. And it's fun. So good news, bad news, good news, great game, a lot of fun. Bad news is out of my pocket. Uh, yeah, you know, and and and, uh, and that valuable thing called time. Right, right? exactly, exactly. Well, I'm excited because now Tom and I are going to play uh, X Wing, and maybe I can uh, beat up on him a little oh, bit. Oh yeah, I'm sure the and the yeah. outer rim <laughs> of <laughs> the galaxy. So, uh, but I think that's going to do it now for uh, issue three. Um, Again, fantastic time sitting here talking with you, Tom. Oh my god! Oh my god! Good times, good times. Uh, hey, episode, do you, you what? Wanna, you want to blast the people with uh, anything? You got uh, any anything you want them to uh, find out about Tom Lucas? Maybe shop Tom Lucas at Amazon a little bit. Or? Yeah, you know, um, I have uh, you know a couple of books up on Amazon. Uh, the most recent is Pax Titanus, and if you enjoyed Star Wars, you you know I think it'd probably be your thing too. For sure, you know comedic space opera, rude jokes, dick jokes, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's the one that I'm still pushing now. Uh, there are a couple other things that are coming out later this year, but yeah, hop on over to Amazon and uh, read uh, Matt's blog. That's right, uh, mattylovescomics.wordpress.com. You can follow me on Twitter at underscore Matt D. Simone. Follow Tom on Twitter at read Tom Lucas. Follow the friggin' podcast uh, at Matty Loves Podcast on Twitter. Um, we're going to be here over the next coming weeks, uh, you know, uh, putting ourselves even more out there on the internets and in the social media. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there we still need to tackle, and trust me, we are going to do this because we're having too much fun doing this, and we're not going to stop. We want as many people to hear uh, us talk about what we think is cool, and hopefully the people listening to us uh, find a little bit of interest in what we're doing. But um, that's going to wrap it up uh, for Dr. Tom Lucas. I'm Matt DeSimone, and this has been another episode of Maddie Loves Podcast. Maddie Loves Podcast. Maddie Loves Podcast.